if we uh, if we we like to start, what I was thinking uh, to start with is maybe if you could explain us a little bit about how, how to treat the flight of airplanes and, yeah. and sailing, which is similar, because I was thinking that we have quite a mix here of mathematicians and physicists and also bankers and yeah. who and filmmakers and archaeologists who might not be so familiar with uh, how, how mathematical treatment of very very complex phenomena looks like and everybody of us not at the moment but usually take airplanes so yeah. when you sit in the airplane you probably think uh, why can that fly and why doesn't it drop out the sky, which they sometimes do, actually, <laughs> if they stall. Yeah. So what about uh, if you give your view on how you can treat flight and sailing with fluid dynamics? Sure. sure. So I, I was prepared a little. <laughs> uh, Gerhard set me this challenge. Um, it's not directly <laughs> my research area, but um, something fluid dynamicists uh, should know about. Um, and it's a, it's a simple question, how do airplanes fly? Um, it's not such a simple answer. Um, and yet there is reams and reams and reams written about it in the sort of popular um, uh, sort of internet discussion forums and things. People argue back and forth about, uh, about this all the time. And um, <coughs> quite often very confused ideas. And, um, and it is because the story is actually a, a little bit more complicated than uh, people are prepared to get to grips with. Um, so this was quite a challenge because I realized, you know, most people here don't have scientific backgrounds. You know, how do I start to present these ideas? And I, I, I hope what I put together will work. I promise there is no mathematics, um, but I will sort of give some flavor, I hope, of, um, of the sort of key ingredients and, and what one has to, to worry about. So shall I, shall I start that, uh, Gerhard? Uh, yes, please. Great, great. So, there. Yeah, so is that all right? Everyone can see that? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Good. So, um, first of all, uh, fluid dynamics, um, and perhaps the fundamental question is what's a fluid? Um, and uh, often you'll see it just, you know, fluid as a liquid or a gas, as if it were a state of matter. I have a, a more fundamental definition of fluid is anything that flows, a material that flows. Um, and so, you know, just to give you an extreme example, I would count uh, salt uh, as, a, as a fluid, um, as a, you know, once you, because you can pour it. So each salt grain is a solid, but a sort of collection of salt is a and sometimes called a granular fluid, but it's a material that flows. Uh, and the common example, some common examples I put here. So air is a fluid, water is a fluid, honey is a, is a fluid. And the statement I really want to make is all fluids are viscous. Uh, what and, about uh, superfluid helium? Yeah, I thought you were going to say that as a physicist. <laughs> so even superfluid helium, of course, you have to be very careful to keep it superfluid. And what can happen there is uh, disturbances will create quantum vortices and the vortices will entangle and the entanglement uh, causes dissipation and that energy dissipation ultimately on the macro scale will, will count as a viscosity, be interpreted as, as a viscosity. Um, but, you know, quantum mechanics aside, let's think of, of air and water and, and honey and uh, viscosity or, you know, stickiness is something that uh, we're very happy to attribute to honey, but perhaps we don't think of water and air as being uh, viscous or at all sticky, uh, but they are, and it's fundamentally important that they are, as, as we'll see. And uh, what I hope to convey to you by the end of this uh, short talk is that actually if air were not sticky, then airplanes would not fly. So ultimately we rely on the viscosity of air to keep airplanes in, in the air. And, and so my two key words for today are viscosity and something called vorticity. And that's illustrated in this figure here. Vorticity is just sort of circular motions. So a vortex or a, you know, a gyre or something. 
uh, is going to be uh, fundamental to the story as well. So another important idea is that size really matters when you're talking about fluid mechanics. So you might think of a lava flow, and I mentioned I've done research on, on lava flow and magma, uh, but on large scales, and this is a, a river of lava in Hawaii, um, even though lava is very, very viscous, it can flow very freely on, on large scales. And actually my more current work is on the flow of the Antarctic ice sheet. And so you think of ice as a solid, but if you're talking about length scales of thousands of kilometers and time scales of tens of thousands of years, then we can think of the ice sheet as a, as a fluid uh, and that the size is important. On the other hand, these spermatozoa down here, and let me just uh, get them swimming again, are uh, swimming through uh, something with the viscosity of water, essentially water, and yet because they're very small, uh, they really feel the viscosity of the water. So viscosity is really felt on small length scales, and that's going to be important. So let's delve into some more sort of theoretical, uh, idealized uh, uh, models of fluid mechanics. And I thought I'd start with an extremely simple problem, which is a thin flat plate edge on to the wind. Okay, so the blue arrow is representing the wind, the black uh, line representing a thin plate and in viscid fluid dynamics. So fluid dynamics without viscosity is what is typically taught in a first course in fluid mechanics. And it's taught because the mathematics is relatively simple. Linear mathematics, as I was saying, uh, can be solved. We can find solutions. And the solution for this problem is that the plate has no influence on the fluid and vice versa. The fluid has no influence on the plate. On the other hand, if we recognize that even air you know, is a viscous fluid, then we have to modify that picture. And the stickiness of the air means that the velocity, the air velocity on the plate is zero. And there's some region in which the speed varies to the uh, free stream, so to the air. And just to give you an idea of how big this region is, um, it's important. Uh, if this were, if this plate were representing a typical aircraft wing, so a meter or two, that sort of thing, and the airspeed were, you know, 100 meters per second, typical of a commercial airliner, then this region in which viscosity is playing a role is about one millimeter. Okay. And so at some level, it feels quite ignorable. It's as if the wing of my aeroplane were about one millimeter thicker than the metal bit. And outside of that region, we can treat the air as if it's inviscid, has no viscosity. And yet this region where viscosity is playing a role turns out to be vitally important. And we can see that if we turn the plate around so that it's face on to the wind. Oh, sorry, uh, one thing I need to say, is that in this region where viscosity is active, we generate vorticity, we generate this rolling motion. And you almost think of, well, the air is sticking to the plate here, but out here it's moving to the right. And so it's almost falling over itself. Okay, it's a few sort of on the floor, but the top half of you rolls over and uh, you generate this uh, rotation motion, this vorticity. Uh, near the plate. So now let's uh, put the plate face onto the wind. And I put a couple of uh, ideas onto one slide. So still the blue is representing the wind, the plate is the black line face on. And we can solve this problem if we treat the fluid as being inviscid, having no viscosity. And the solution is indicated by the, the blue lines here. And the first thing you notice is that it's symmetric in front and behind the plate. And I'll say something about more about that in a moment. But from what I've just told you, there is a region very close to the plate where we really ought to worry about viscosity, the fact that the air is sticking to the plate, and that's generating vorticity. And it's generating it in this direction on the top of the plate, 
top half of the plate and uh, in this direction. Um, so in this direction on the top half of the plate and this direction on the bottom half. If you look at what the pressure field is and you can compute that uh, mathematically, you find that there's high pressure where the uh, flow is um, slow. So in particular at these so-called stagnation points uh, where these streamlines meet the plate, zero flow, high pressure, and where the flow is fast over the edges of these plates, uh, it's all being squeezed sort of towards those edges and around, the pressure is low. And that's something I'll come back to again. Um, but again, we have this symmetry. We have high pressure on both sides of the plate and that balances. And it means that according to my calculations, of inviscid fluid dynamics, if I ignore viscosity, there is no net force on the plate. Okay. And that's known as Dal uh, uh, D'Alembert's paradox. So it was a big disappointment to the physicists who first came up with the equations of uh, fluid mechanics. So it had been the domain of engineers and the physicists got interested. They came up with equations that described inviscid fluid dynamics. They solved the equations and then realized that According to these equations, the predictions, there was no net force on any object. Okay, so here I've illustrated with a flat plate, but it's true of any object moving through an inviscid fluid has no force on it. Okay, even if you're sort of face on, and, and that just doesn't accord to experience. You know, we know if we're trying to push our hand through water, we experience a force. And so something is wrong. So anyway, that uh, we've got our um, sort of imagined inviscid flow outside. We've got viscosity acting very close to the plate, generating some vorticity. And we have a pressure gradient, high pressure here, low pressure here. And that pressure gradient drives a flow in the opposite direction. Notice a flow in this viscous region. The flow is actually reversed from what it is outside. Here it's going downwards and to the side. And in this viscous region, the, the pressure field is pushing it upwards. And that flow of those, that viscous fluid carries the vorticity. A little animation there. And moves the vorticity to the edges of the plate. It accumulates there. Notice that the vorticity has the same sense of rotation both sides. So this one gets carried over here and adds to it, all in the same direction of rotation, and gets shed off the back of the plate. So that vorticity then gets carried downstream by the flow. And that breaks the symmetry. And now this is much more familiar. We now have a wake behind this flat plate. So you know some people might try to tailgate a lorry for instance, get into that dead wake and they can cycle much faster. I don't recommend it, um, dangerous thing to do, uh, but nevertheless, that's what we have. And the pressure in that wake is, um, is low. We've broken the symmetry we have high pressure on the front of the plate, low pressure on the back, which means this plate is now experiencing a force. On the other hand, I've deliberately been schematic here because the flow in this wake is very complicated and turbulent, and I can't solve it anymore uh, using analytical methods. I can solve it on a computer maybe. Okay, so actually we've got most of our answer here. Let's just put some of it together. Um, oh, sorry, and here's just an illustration. Um, you know, that uh, wake and that asymmetry is what um, allows us to row through uh, water. And here you can see these lovely vortices left behind from my rowing stroke. Uh, and actually some small uh, animals, so this is a pond skater, aerial view. Um, pond skaters actually row across the surface of a pond. So they can stand on the surface tension of the water and then they basically push against uh, the top surface of the water, leaving these lovely vortices behind them. And uh, that's what propels them forward. And if you want to illustrate this talk to your friends, uh, just grab a cup of coffee and move a spoon through it, and uh, you can create some nice vortices uh, behind the spoon. 
And we now that those know that those vortices are being generated by uh, viscosity uh, acting in concert with that solid surface and the vorticity stripping off uh, the edges of the solid surface. Okay, so I, <laughs> I just went to Google and I typed how do aeroplanes fly and I just grabbed the first picture that was uh, came to light and it was this um, comes from a particular website but could come from any of thousands of websites. And this is the basic explanation that will, people will give. Um, aeroplanes fly because uh, the, the flow is faster on the top of the wing than it is along the bottom of the wing. And as I mentioned before, where fluids flow faster, you have low pressure. And so that means that the pressure is lower on the top, higher on the bottom, and that high pressure on the bottom pushes up on the wing and makes the aeroplane stay in the air. Where all the debate and controversy on the web is, and throughout uh, a lot of scientific communities, etc., is why is the airflow faster on the top of the wing? And here you will get a lot of false uh, explanations given to you. And the most common one is, well, it's to do with the shape of the wing, and I have, you know, quite often wings have a curved upper surface and a flat lower surface. So the air has further to go over the top and it does over the bottom. That's why it's faster. And actually the geometry of the wing has almost no effect on the ability to fly. So, you know, um, aerobatic people can fly their aeroplanes upside down. So that throws this argument um, uh, you know, destroys that argument because now I've got my bulbous bit of my wing at the bottom and yes, I can still fly. Um, and in principle, I could make my wing out of a flat plate and I could still fly that wing. Um, so it's nothing to do with geometry. So how do we understand that? And that's, it's actually worth going back and thinking about the mathematical calculation of what the flow would look like if there were no viscosity. So what does inviscid fluid dynamics uh, tell us? Well, I don't want to show you any equations, but it turns out we can experimentally uh, make a, an inviscid simulator. So I won't go into the details of this. This is actually using a very viscous fluid, but in a special geometry, which simulates the flow uh, that is, would arise uh, in an inviscid fluid, one without viscosity. And the front of this all looks quite fine, but the back of this looks a bit uncomfortable, actually. Why is it the flow here has decided to go upwards away from the wing? Well, it's to do with the fact First of all, that there is no vorticity in an inviscid fluid. You can't generate vorticity without viscosity. And it comes back to d'Alembert's paradox that there is a certain four aft symmetry. And in fact, there is no net. This flow, this uh, inviscid flow, would give you no force of any sort on the wing, no drag and no lift. So if we look at the next video, which is a real fluid flow in air, so now a viscous flow, and now these flow lines look much more comfortable than what we would expect. In particular, that the flow uh, leaves the back of the wing smoothly. It doesn't sort of decide it wants to leap into the air again, but it leaves that trailing edge smoothly. So how do we understand that? Uh, why, why is that happening? And it comes back to this idea of vorticity, that if I took this inviscid flow, there would be a little uh, halo, if you like, of a little region very close to the wing, about a millimeter thick, where viscosity is important, where vorticity is being generated. And also, if I look near the trailing edge, we have high pressure near this so-called uh, stagnation point where the flow is leaving and low pressure around the trailing edge because the fluid has to move quickly around these small areas. And that high pressure to low pressure pushes the viscous fluid, the, the, 
viscous region and the vorticity down towards the trailing edge. And so the actions in that um, thin region are doing that. And the net effect of all of that is that you have more vorticity generated on the top of the wing, whatever its shape, than you do on the bottom of the wing. And you can show this mathematically, you can sort of add all these contributions together. So we've got three going anti-clock, sorry, four going anti-clockwise. Uh, sorry, four going clockwise. Oh, my clock's reversed. Four going <laughs> clockwise, three going anti-clockwise. The net effect is a vorticity going clockwise, got more clockwise than anti-clockwise. And so the net effect is to have this added flow, this extra flow being generated by the viscosity, which is going downstream above the wing and upstream below the wing. So we're adding to the flow above the wing, reducing the flow below the wing. And that's why we have faster flow over the top than over the bottom. And then after that, the Bernoulli effect takes over and we have lift. So uh, just to end this, I said, uh, the shape of the wing uh, doesn't matter. Um, so why do uh, engineers spend so much time designing wings? And uh, the whole reason is to, uh, to keep the flow looking like this. So how do aeroplanes not fly? So one way to stop them flying is to increase the angle of attack, which is what's happening here. And as I increase the angle to the wind, you can see that this separation of the vorticity happens right at the leading edge. Okay, and we have this dead wake uh, above. And as soon as I have that dead wake, I've lost control and I will lose my lift. Um, and the airplane will fall out of the sky. Stall is not a good thing. Um, in There's general. an Air France flight from, I think, Brazil to Paris, which had uh, the pitot tubes, so the, uh, the velocity measurement uh, equipment yeah. was failing. And so they uh, lost, uh, lost the lift and dropped out of the sky. And I think 300 people died. That was a couple of years ago. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not hoping to scare people with this talk, <laughs> but, uh, but this can happen, stall can happen. And the, most of the design of the wing is to ensure that the flow remains, so the technical word is remains attached to the wing. In other words, that the flow keeps close to the wing uh, all the time in different flying conditions. So, and, and so to try to avoid stall. And I thought I'd stop there um, and uh, take any questions, put this picture back. Uh, Quickly, I think it's just such a lovely picture, um, but just illustrates the fact that the, these lovely swirls you're seeing here are coming off the wingtips of uh, this aeroplane, just flown through a cloud, uh, which is nice, uh, showing that up nicely. Any questions, Hugh? I'm oh, sorry, and the thing I meant to finish <laughs> with, next time you're in, in an aeroplane and flying along, uh, you should um, just uh, remember that you're staying up in the air all because of <coughs> one millimeter thick of air over, <laughs> over the wings. That's, that's all that's holding you up. Uh, could, I, <clears throat> could I ask when this science was really understood and explained, and did the designers of the early airplanes 100 years ago or more, did they understand why uh, the airplane would would be able to gain height and stay up? Well, I'm I'm not a not an aeronautical engineer, uh, less still a historian of it all. But I think that early flight was largely empirical. Um, that uh, people just tried it and and saw that it stayed up. From a theoretical point of view and a sort of engineering development point of view, it was noticed, of course, you, you know, I showed you some experiments, it was noticed that the uh, flow detaches smoothly from the trailing edge. 
And it was understood and realized that um, that was achieved by somehow vorticity or circulation, as it's sometimes called, uh, being generated around the wing. So that was understood. And in terms of design and mathematical computations, people simply added that as a condition. So, and it's called the cutter condition. It says that um, I'm going to solve my inviscid fluid dynamics, but add to my solution a point vortex. So a vortex in the wing, and I'm going to choose the strength of that vortex so as to make the flow leave the leading edge smoothly. So they couldn't compute the circulation that was needed, mm. the vorticity that was needed, um, except by this empirical condition that it was going to be just enough to make the flow leave smoothly at the trailing edge. The understanding that I've uh, tried to convey today very simply um, relates to a mathematical theory, fluid dynamical theory called triple deck theory. And that was really developed in the 1960s and then through the 1970s. So that's when a proper understanding of this generation and, and how that stagnation point moved to the back edge, et cetera, was, was developed. And could I ask one more question? Uh, you explained that it all depends on the the air layer one millimeter thick above and below the wing but the the thickness of the air the density of the air is completely different at 10,000 feet at 30,000 feet and Absolutely. Concord used to fly at I think 56,000 feet yep. so does it mean in, in the days when we had Concord was it all depending on a, a thinner, but therefore thicker, uh, or great in terms of size, greater uh, layer above and below the wing? No, actually a thinner layer. Um, so their more rarefied air will also have lower viscosity, which means that layer is even thinner. On the other hand, it's also going much faster. And ah. so that's, um, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to fly very easily at 60 miles an hour at 50,000 feet. Um, so you need the combination of the speed. Um, so, well, you need the speed to compensate for the thinness of the air uh, as you go up. Uh, Hugh, uh, about, the stand, uh, about the status of knowledge at the beginning of aeronautics, uh, to prepare for the discussion today, I looked at the NASA website and mm -hmm. there's a kind of an online museum about the Wright brothers and oh, it yes. describes how the Wright brothers developed uh, yes. uh, their first airplanes mm -hmm. and they were very, very systematical about it. So there was no mm -hmm. internet in those days. So they went to the Smith, uh, to the librarian at the Smithsonian uh, 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 Museum and so on to get get their information collected but they were looking at the status of knowledge and they had a wind tunnel as well for their experiments yeah okay uh, so yeah. Yeah. there's a very good explanation they were quite sophisticated I, they were quite it's document i didn't read through all of it but there's enormous amount of documentation on it. it's like an online museum for the wright brothers on the nasa website i found yeah. it in uh, looking for how the how you know how um Sure. preparing uh, for the question I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's also a lot of the work is being done. There's a lot of books by uh, Boeing engineers. And there's one, I forgot the name. There's one Boeing engineer who at the same time was also a very uh, passionate sailor and he, who designed some of the sailing boats for the America Cup. So he was mm -hmm. kind of combining the sailing uh, sailing uh, and his professional, so his hobby was sailing and his profession was designing aircraft for Boeing. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing, but maybe everyone knows this, but, uh, you know, yachts can sail faster than the wind. So um, not, oh. not true of a, an ancient galleon because they're just being pushed by the wind from behind. They can only 
you know, if theoretical maximum for a galleon would be uh, the wind speed, but uh, a yacht uh, sailing along um, sort of into the wind or half into the wind on a broad reach, for example, if you're a sailor, um, can, can sail faster than the wind. And that is because they have a force being generated by the shape of the, the sail, which is acting like a wing. And um, if you can reduce the drag, then uh, that force can, can propel you uh, indeed faster than the wind. It's, um, yeah, this, uh, essentially, they're essentially, well, they are flying. Uh, through, through it's very the, similar i mean from what i gathered from this man's work i forgot the name now and he also wrote that a lot of the what people uh assumed about how sales work was wrong until he came along <laughs> okay. it's similar to what you said about the flying also yeah well a, a lot of modern sailboats these days have um solid wings as well rigid wings uh, rigid sails. They look very similar to airplane airplane uh, wings. Um, so uh, and of course you have to be able to tack. So you have to be able to go both sides of the wing wind, and so your sails should be symmetric because you don't want to just be able to sail with the wind on your right hand side. You'd like to be able to sail with the wind on your left hand side as well. So um, those, um, yeah. As rigid wings are designed symmetrically. So, what about going to the? If there are more questions, anybody questions about flying? Is, yeah, I want to uh, make a precise. Uh, this is very uh, curious, uh, fine uh, uh, explanation. So, I want to understand why uh, Bodhisi uh, is created uh, more than a uh, more. Uh, this upper side, the lower side. Before that, uh, you mentioned about pressure at the trailing edge. The pressure uh, 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 just uh, beneath of uh, trailing edge is uh, higher, and uh, above is uh, much lower. Then uh, you start to... Uh, uh, the, yeah, the pressure at the trailing edge is, is very low. Yes. And yeah. then... I want to relate uh, this kind of things uh, with why uh, more vorticity is created above uh, upper side uh, the uh, wing than lower side. Well, it's really just because you're moving that uh, that rear stagnation point. So we're getting technical now, but we're moving that rear stagnation point from um, from the upper side of the wing. And, and going up like that, mm -hmm. back down towards the trailing edge. And so you're, you know, you, in effect, you've just increased the effect, effective, the effective length of the top of the, the wing. Okay. Because before so, that, you could measure the length of the wing from, as it were, the leading edge just to the stagnation point. Mm -hmm. And now we've moved the stagnation point backwards. And so we've got a, a greater okay. region here over which we're generating. So, uh, so main uh, main uh, reason is uh, this uh, traveling length of of the up uh, length of the upper side is uh, longer than uh, lower side. If you like, but it's not because of the. Um, it, it's not because of the shape of the wing, because I could have a perfectly symmetric ring wing, okay. and the same okay. argument would apply. But if you like, it's the effective length. The effective length being, as I say, from the leading edge round to the stagnation point. Stagnation point. Okay. <laughs> And we've moved the stagnation point, so we've sort of elongated the the effective length of the wing. And then uh, this uh, elongation is made by creating vorticity. Yep. On, on the upper side. Yeah, if we had inverted flow, then mm -hmm. you know we 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 can't fly. Then uh, viscosity is important for creation of vorticity. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, we, you know, we, without viscosity, there's no yeah. vorticity. 
All right. And um, so that's the key message. And 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 while we've, we're sort of talking science, I think the, the important distinction to make is that in inviscid flow, forces correspond to accelerations, Newton's second law. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, absolutely, yeah, right, right, yes. Yeah. With viscous flow, forces correspond to velocities. Yes. So in a very viscous flow, it's as if every bit of the flow were at terminal velocity. Mm -hmm. so the direct relationship between force and velocity. Yes. And that's why if I look at, say, the, the edge on plate, and I said we get this reversed flow, so we've, you know, everywhere the pressure is high at the mid plane and low at the top, but in the inviscid outer region, we've got, so high pressure here, low pressure here means there's a force this way. And that force is decelerating the flow away from the wing. So that's getting slower as it comes down, mm -hmm. this acceleration that matters, but close to the wing where viscosity is active, the force relates to velocity and so we get a flow upwards and that's causing your counter flow so you know although the flow you know the outer flow yeah. is going down the viscous bits going up you get this counter flow and that counter flow also helps to strip off the, the vorticity at the mm -hmm. top and create our vortices the edge of our teaspoon or the edge of the or blade there it is yeah Thank you. It's very clear. This one. Mm. So, if everybody is clear about flying, uh, Gray, what about talking more closer to your current work about uh, the marshy layers? Yeah, then I'll be much, much on much firmer ground. <laughs> uh, talking about some of my own work. This presentation is actually shorter um, and and more pictorial, but I hope there's some interesting ideas here and and, and some some questions at, at the end. Let's, let's do that. Okay, so you can see this still. Gerhard, is that okay? I'm not hearing you. Have you just put yourself on mute? It's visible, it's very clear. Okay. Now good. I'm unmuted, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. it's perfect, it's perfect. Good. Perfect, good. perfect. So as I said uh, earlier, I most of my researches have been about freezing things. <laughs> Started out freezing uh, hot rock um, it's, I've worked on freezing metallic alloys, uh, for instance, I done work relating to freezing soils, lots of interesting problems uh, there, but I'm going to talk today about freezing the oceans uh, to form sea ice. So sea ice is what you're seeing in the foreground here. Um, it's the ice that forms directly by freezing the ocean. And in uh, a single winter season, if you start with open ocean, uh, you'll grow about a meter of, uh, of sea ice. So uh, relatively thin. In the background, you can see an ice sheet, so glacial ice sheet. Uh, and this by contrast can be, well, if I think of Antarctica, uh, thickest points about four kilometers thick. Uh, and the edges where it flows into the ocean typically about half a kilometer thick. And uh, that ice sheet breaks off periodically and creates icebergs. Um, and icebergs, you know, come off the ice sheets. These ice sheets formed from snow. And so the ice sheets are essentially pure ice, pure solid ice cubes that you can put in your whiskey or whatever. Um, uh, whereas the, uh, the sea ice, uh, and it's the icebergs that, you know, sank the Titanic, uh, not this stuff. So this stuff, sea ice forming on the ocean. I'll try and give you an idea of why sea ice is so important to our climate and how it, what it is and how it works. And the first thing to understand is what is special about uh, freezing um, a mixture, in this case, a mixture of salt and water. 
So this is a little lab experiment. I've used my impurity, in this case, uh, some clay particles, just because they're nice and visible. But what you can see is if you uh, go slowly enough, then all of the impurity is rejected from the ice. So although you're freezing salt water, you form pure ice crystals and the impurity is pushed ahead of the front uh, into the ocean, if you like. However, story is a bit more complicated than that because this accumulation of impurity um, retards the growth of the ice, uh, provides a constraint on the growth, and the ice can escape that constraint by changing its shape. So we actually get a, a, what's called a morphological instability. Or a morphological just meaning a shape change and instability meaning this flat interface doesn't remain flat anymore. And if I freeze more quickly, uh, we actually see something like this. So we no longer form a solid block of pure ice. The ice is the blue stuff in here, and that is pure. There's no salt in the ice, but the impurity, in this case, plate clay particles, but the same would apply to salt, is in the spaces between these ice crystals. And this is still liquid. And if you think you've never met a mushy layer before, let me tell you that I'm all very confident that all of you have, at least as children, um, because uh, you've all, I suspect, um, eaten an ice lolly. And one of the things you may have done, I certainly remember doing this as a child, is instead of sort of biting off a chunk of ice lolly, I, you can suck on it. And if you suck on an ice lolly, you suck out all the nice sugary syrup and all the harmful E numbers that are making it red or whatever. And what's left behind is a sort of rather fragile collection of ice crystals, clear ice crystals. And that's because the ice lolly actually is not solid. Ice lollies may seem solid, but they're not. They actually have solid ice crystals. And in between is syrup. Basically, during fabrication, you start out with a sugar solution, when you freeze that sugar solution, the sugar gets concentrated in the space between the ice crystals and the whole thing becomes very viscous, uh, create a very viscous syrup. And so it doesn't flow out of the ice lolly, it stays in there, but with a bit of effort, you can suck it out. So that impurity is in a liquid form uh, in between. By the way, just a, another, mentioned whiskey earlier, you maybe think I'm alcohol obsessed. Um, this is also used by uh, some people to make moonshine. So you can take a, a low grade alcohol and freeze it. And uh, you will take out all the water into ice, drain off the remaining liquid, which will be uh, enriched in alcohol. And so you can make your spirits like that. It's a very bad idea because unlike distillation, which takes off the water, uh, sorry, takes off the alcohol in a pure form and leaves the water and all the rubbish behind, if you make moonshine, you take off the water, you leave the alcohol behind, but you also leave all the rubbish behind, all the harmful impurities. So, um, uh, not a good idea. But the basic story here is you freeze a, a mixture and most typically you form a mushy layer, solid ice crystals, impurities in between. And this is the, the character of sea ice. Okay, so here's a, lo a laboratory experiment. We're gonna grow some sea ice in the laboratory. Uh, we, it's time-lapsed. So we're looking at about six hours of real time uh, compressed into about a minute. And um, so this is salt water below, there's a cold plate at the top and ice is growing uh, from the top. Uh, you can already see that the ice doesn't look much like the ice cubes you would get in your uh, deep freeze. 
It's got some structure here. You might just get some texture at the bottom. If we take a, an upwards looking view at that texture, this is what it looks like. You can see the individual ice crystals and the salt there is in, in liquid form, in brine in between those uh, ice crystals. You may have also noticed a slight shimmer in the liquid behind here. And we can see that shimmer a bit more clearly if we shine a light from behind and put some tracing paper in front, and then we get what's called a shadow graph. So you can see this sort of thing, typically over a hot radiator, you'll see shadows on the wall uh, sometimes, and we're doing the same thing here in the laboratory. So it's showing up density differences. And what we're seeing are these plumes, these streamers of uh, concentrated salt solution, brine, coming out of the mushy layer, coming out of the sea ice. The disadvantage of um, the shadow graph is I can no longer see my ice. And in particular, I can't see where these streamers are coming from. And so what we've also done is to use MRI, and that allows us to see inside the ice. So this top region is our ice mushy layer, the bottom region is our solution. And, uh, there are these dissolution channels formed. Uh, and I'll say something about, uh, no, let me say something about them now. Why are they formed? They're formed because the liquid in between the ice crystals has had all the salt concentrated into it. So it's a very concentrated salt solution. And because of the increased salt, it's also denser, heavier. And therefore, it would like to drain out, it would like to convect out of uh, the ice into uh, this less salty ocean underneath. But now let's think of it. I'm taking the, the liquid is saltier at the top, saltiest at the top, where it's coldest, because more ice has been taken out more water has been taken out where it's colder. And we're taking that salt, that very concentrated brine downwards through this ice. And now it acts in the same way as when you throw salt onto an icy road, which liquefies the ice. And so where we have downflow in this mushy layer, we redissolve the ice, that salt uh, redissolves the ice and carves out that channel. We'll see that a bit more clearly in just a moment. So mathematically and also in the laboratory, one can turn this picture upside down and it's just too convenient. Uh, it's a nice system to use. Um, this material we're freezing here uh, happens to be ammonium chloride to detail, except uh, to say that um, in terms of its crystal structure, this material, which is nice to use in the laboratory, it uh, you know, solidifies at, at reasonable temperatures, et cetera, uh, is structurally much more similar to metals. So actually this is uh, an analog experiment for the casting of a metallic alloy. So an alloy, remember, is a mixture of different metals. And when you freeze a mixture of metals, those uh, components of the alloy again separate, just like the salt and water separate. And you form a mushy layer. And if you're not careful, you can form these dissolution channels. Okay. So the same thing that we've seen before, slightly different crystal structure, uh, but you can see that all these fine scale structures, uh, crystals making a forest really dendritic forest of uh, crystals, which we call a mushy layer. Same things happens in this case. Uh, we are crystallizing the salt into the solid, which means that the liquid that's left behind has less salt in it and will rise because it's less dense. And so now these plumes, now you can sort of see both things happening. These plumes are, have reduced salt in them but the same thing happens and we can create the dissolution channel. So I thought I'd just finish by saying, uh, without giving you any equations, what I, what's my research, uh, what does it do? 
what it does, it takes a system like this and it tries to formulate equations to describe it and then solve those equations to make predictions for what will happen. So we can start out by what are called field equations, equations that govern what happens in the interior of a region. And we start with the fluid equations, they're the, the equations of fluid mechanics that have been known now for uh, a couple of centuries, more or less. Um, much newer equations are equations governing this region of mixed phase. We've now got solid and liquid commingling, and we need different equations to describe that. So that was part of uh, my early research was to develop such equations. Though it turns out there'd been, you know, other people had preceded me, um, which is not uncommon in research. And these equations have been around actually since the sort of late 1950s, uh, mid 60s, dominantly, because uh, they're essentially conservation laws. What changed, however, was through the 60s and early 70s, these equations were used diagnostically. Basically, equations that related certain variables to other variables, which meant that a metallurgist, for example, could measure the temperature and then use the equations to tell it to infer what the composition was at that point. So it's used as a diagnostic tool. What hadn't happened was uh, no one had solved those equations uh, to make predictions of what would happen in a given system. And in particular, this channel formation had not been predicted. Um, been seen, but there was no mathematical theory to predict them. Now, in order to solve equations, one needs what are called boundary conditions. This tells you how bits of fluid interact with other bits of fluid, but it doesn't tell you how fluid interacts with its container. And, in, and more difficult is how it interacts with a different medium. So we have fluid equations up here, we have mushy layer equations in here, but we have to relate the solutions in the fluids to the solutions in the mushy layer across an interface between them. And as we saw in the little close up just now, that interface is really very complicated. So how do you formulate the equations that couple the fluid to the mushy layer? It's a complicated story. Um, this red line uh, was towards the end of my PhD. And this yellow line uh, was developed about 20 years later. The very long uh, research that led uh, finally to a complete picture uh, that included um, actually what happens at the, at the walls of this dissolution channel. So without going into any detail, what can you do with this? You know, why bother um, doing any of this research? At the end of the day, uh, what we've been able to do so you can solve all of this, by the way, uh, but it requires quite a lot of computation, a lot of heavy lifting. And now let's think about the climate. Uh, very high resolution, very high resolution climate models will have a grid spacing of about 10 kilometers. Basically says that the climate model doesn't know about any process that is happening on a scale smaller than 10 kilometers in the horizontal. Now, I told you earlier that sea ice is about a meter thick. And these dissolution channels are a few millimeters wide. And they turn out to be very, very important. So we have to incorporate. And so there's no way you can run this computation within a climate model. You need something much simpler. And without giving you the whole story, what uh, I did with a PhD student uh, quite recently, well, it's about five, uh, seven years ago now, but it feels recent um, in a whole career, is to use all of that knowledge and encapsulate that in a simple one-dimensional model that somehow captures uh, what's going on in the mushy layer and captures the important uh, characteristic of these channels, which is that they deliver salts to the ocean. And so my final major slide, this is just output from the model. Um, you don't need to take much about away from this. 
except that we can predict temperature, we can predict the distribution of the fraction of the mushy layer that is solid, and we can uh, predict the composition uh, distribution of salt through that uh, uh, sea ice, layer of sea ice. And this gives you an indication of uh, why it's important. This is measuring something called buoyancy flux, basically um, how much density are you supplying to the ocean, which as I'll show you just now drives the ocean circulation. Um, and you can do that in various ways. You can cool the ocean because cold fluids generally are denser and will sink. So cold water is heavier than warm water and cold water will sink. And cooling oceans give you buoyancy fluxes down here. What you can do much more efficiently is to take some of the water out by um, either by evaporation in the Mediterranean, for example, or by, by freezing. So the Mediterranean is acting like your whiskey still, and the, and the polar oceans are acting like your moonshine, um, taking the, the water out and leaving the salt behind, and that salt gets out into the ocean. And the most efficient thing that happens on Earth is happens in what are called polynias, and these are regions where ice crystals are formed, but then are blown away by the wind most typically in Antarctic, because there are very strong winds that come off the continent and blow the ice out into, away from the coastline out to sea. It, very rapid ice production uh, and, and lots of salt production and the densest waters in, in the world's oceans are formed in, Ant in Antarctica in these polynias. But if you form this continuous layer of sea ice, so-called consolidated sea ice, then the story is much more complicated. Little illustration of it here. The climate models until very recently simply assumed that sea ice had some given fixed foot salinity. The, the magic number was four parts per thousand. And this was just empirically based on field evidence. People had taken cores of, of sea ice, measure a whole lot of cores, you say, well, you know, most of the time, sea ice is around four parts per thousand of uh, salt. And so that's what we'll put in our models. And that gives you this blue dashed um, prediction. On the other hand, if you understand the dynamics of the interior of the sea ice, as I've tried to sort of illustrate pictorially for you here, you come up with this model, you make this uh, rather different prediction of uh, the buoyancy fluxes in the oceans. Why is that important? It's important because this so-called uh, thermohaline, thermohaline convection, so convection driven by buoyancy differences, is really being driven from the polar oceans. So a major engine house of the world's uh, circulations is the Greenland Sea uh, on the Arctic Basin, dense water being formed here by production of sea ice, forming deep water. This is the this is right at the ocean floor, this blue current, blue ribbon, called the Labrador Current, because it comes down the Labrador coast here of Canada. Um, and then it continues on down, feeds into the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And then the Gulf Stream, you should not think of as being driven by heating at the equator, but it's simply the return flow of the Labrador Current. It's the top side of your conveyor belt the conveyor belts being driven here. And that's why we need to know about buoyancy fluxes and to be able to compute those uh, accurately. So I'll stop there. Um, that gives you a little bit of a flavor, I hope, of yeah, what I do, that's what I have done. Yeah. Uh, especially the last picture I heard, I, I'm not an expert on uh, climate, change at all. But I heard that this uh, global uh, maritime flow pattern is potentially going to change because of global warming. So your work is directly in, uh, concerned with these changes. Oh, uh, yeah, so I don't know if you've seen the disaster movie The Day After Tomorrow. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't recommend it as a film. 
<laughs> it's a sort of a B movie a disaster movie. Um, but it, as uh, as movies often do, it takes to an extreme uh, a valid scientific idea. And the scientific idea is that global warming, uh, the first effect, probably, um, as far as these sorts of matters are concerned, uh, is to melt Greenland. Actually, more so Greenland is melting a lot at the moment. And the concern is not so much for the immediate runoff of water, loss of glaciers, but that that water can get to the base of the glacial ice sheet. And then the ice sheet flows more rapidly and you discharge lots and lots of uh, icebergs into the ocean. So that increased meltwater could destabilize the Greenland ice sheet. And there've been, you know, there are paleoclimate records of, of such events of massive uh, iceberg ejections from um, the Laurentide ice sheet, etc. And so, you know, if you lose, suddenly lose uh, Greenland into the Arctic Basin and the Greenland Sea, um, then you create this fresh, because Greenland is all fresh ice, you create this freshwater layer uh, on the top of the ocean. And fresh water, of course, is less dense than salty water. It will form a layer on the top. It'll float on top of the existing ocean. And now, because it's fresh, even if you can freeze that, you're no longer going to be releasing salt into the ocean. And so, as I showed you before, the convection that you get from just cooling is much less than the convection that you get from salt release when you form ice. So the scientific idea is if you melt Greenland, you freshen the Greenland Sea, then you shut down, and actually you don't shut down, I'll say that then, but you significantly weaken the thermohaline circulation. You sort of, you will cut off, um, you will stop probably the Labrador current. Um, you'll stop the, well, you won't stop the Gulf Stream. <laughs> So let me talk about the Gulf Stream because it's something you learn about in school, people know about. The Gulf Stream gets about half of its energy in the way that I've just described by the Labrador current sinking in the ocean. And it gets its other half of its energy from wind. So just the, the circulation of the general wind patterns uh, push the Gulf Stream. So, um, yeah, so you would reduce it by half. But let's say you shut it off, you shut off the Gulf Stream and then suddenly um, you have an ice age in, now, that, now I'm taking to extremes, but this is the day after tomorrow disaster movie. Um, you uh, create um, your uh, new ice age in, in Western Europe and, and North America. Okay. So that, you know, there's in, some important science in there that um, global warming can, can freshen the Greenland Sea and that will change, uh, weaken the, the thermohaline circulation, and that will change our climate at the very least locally. Um, we could get a lot uh, cold, colder in um, Western Europe. Um, but yeah. Questions? You, uh, do you have a question concerning the global warming? Okay, it's, it's just, <laughs> just, uh, just uh, uh, circulation of the seawater is, I think, time scale is a thousand year or something like that. T time scale of the uh, ocean water circulate. Um, so complete or, circulation, um, yeah. uh, decades. Yeah, decades, I, I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you followed a followed a parcel of, of water from the Arctic basin, sort of yeah. down to the bottom and along and, and coming back. But there's a, a deep a deep uh, sea current. It's very slow. It's and not so much that. So the current is faster than I just said. You know, the Gulf Stream is up to about ten centimeters a second. I uh, so. Uh, so that's quite fast. What is slow is the so-called upwelling. Yeah. So you get water to the bottom. Uh, it's the, but the, and that's localized into the Labrador current. 
but the, the upwelling from the bottom of the ocean upwards is much more distributed okay. throughout the oceans. And that, that process is very slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I thought uh, your picture of the global current, a uh, sea current, uh, is uh, in, in some part is very deep. Uh, they travel deep under the sea. Yes. And so I first think, of all, it's not my. So I should say that the picture is due to someone called Wally Broker, um, okay, and it's uh -huh. been around a, right. a few decades now. It's very simplistic, mm -hmm. um, but it just gives the idea of of sort of significant sources. As I said earlier, the the densest water and the deepest water is generated in the Antarctic. Uh, and that comes and then the Arctic dense water comes in and it tends to form a layer above the Antarctic water. Mm. So you get these various layers uh, within the ocean of waters that have been generated in different places. Thank you. Can I ask? Yes, of course. Um, if you, the story that you were just giving us um, actually works, does this sort of imply that global warming could be self-correcting in that it could precipitate cooling to a degree that might then reverse its effects? Or will we have a sort of a curious situation where say, somebody, somewhere like Europe is behaving like Siberia whilst say around Japan, it's suddenly becoming horrendously hot and we'll get a curious mismatch of that sort or yeah, perhaps uh, and I think it's the story doesn't take that far. I think it's the, it's the thing that's least appreciated about global warming because we, you know, you say global warming and you think everywhere is going to get hotter. Mm. Uh, we'll get hotter on average, what we will see are more extremes and more, more regional variations. So more desertification, of uh, different areas, uh, so, uh, but also more temporal variability. So, you know, stronger storms, colder winters, hotter summers. So, yeah, much, much greater temporal variability, but also much greater geographical variability. Mm. Has this happened in the past? Anything comparable that we could look at as a sort of geologically? Um, so there are various signals that you can look at. One thing that is very well established is the relationship between atmospheric CO2 and, and global temperatures, average global temperatures, and that's in the ice core records. Mm. Um, and those sorts of events have tended to be associated with volcanism um, so as, as a primary source of, of greenhouse gases. Actually, not just CO2, but methane, which is a, an even more potent uh, greenhouse gas. And gases. methane's a major... Um, question I gather now because melting in Siberia is causing release of huge amounts of methane which have been trapped for millennia. Yeah, so there is methane trapped in various forms. Um, so it's trapped in seabeds um, in uh, so in coastal in waters in the form of hydrates, which are like little ice cages of um, ice. And there's concern that uh, global warming could release a lot of that. Um, also concerned that uh, regions of permafrost uh, will will become exposed um, and essentially to, well I th I, I'm talking without complete knowledge here but I think large areas of those would essentially be peat bogs if they weren't frozen they're sort of frozen peat bogs and so if you unfreeze those you can also get a lot of methane uh, released from that yeah. Very interesting. So methane is, is much more potent than CO2. On the other hand, it is relatively short-lived. It tends to get broken down in the upper atmosphere. And the latest argument is that we should stop having dairy and things like that because animals release methane. Presumably we ought to get rid of some humans because I expect we do too. I Nobody think we mentions do. That aspect. Especially as we grow older, I'm finding. <laughs> <laughs> no pensions, just end us all at 65. That's right. <laughs> Hugh, do you have questions about the 
uh, global warming. Is no, I don't want to move into the subject of global warming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because it will go on for hours. And I'm afraid, I think that was really fascinating. And um, I very much enjoyed it. And I've learned a lot. Good, thank you. <laughs> so if we move to the next session, as our next section, uh, you are the vice master. So you must have ideas about the developments of Trinity and you know what you, how you want to influence the uh, developments in Trinity. And yes, yeah, so the vice master is a, is a curious role. <laughs> And um, it's, uh, there's no job description. Uh, and in some sense, so I've been senior tutor as well. And I, so I understand that sort of thing. It's much clearer what, uh, what the job is about. Um, you know, it's about education and it's about pastoral care. Um, and you have, a, you, know, you have a constituency in some sense that, that is your responsibility. Um, and the master we all know is, is uh, you know, takes a... Um, uh, a leadership role, uh, particularly through chairing the council, college council, which is where the, the real power resides. It's the college council that, that makes decisions on things. Um, so what on earth does the vice master do? Uh, so it, uh, it's in many ways a background role. Um, so I chair a lot of committees um, and uh, sort of keep those sorts of things uh, functioning. But I suppose it's because I chair a lot of committees or just because of the nature of, of how relationships develop. And the vice master ends up being a sounding board for uh, a lot of the other college officers. So I, um, I say, how do I spend my week? You know, it's often in, in discussion with the people who are really doing the work in some sense, um, but just uh, as a sounding board for uh, from what, what might go well down well with the college as a whole, what might go down well with the fellowship, what seems sensible, um, just an opportunity for them to try out uh, ideas and things like that. So you say, you know, what are my plans for the college? And it's not really a role that lends itself to that. I mean, I have no um, great authority. And uh, certainly in terms of strategic uh, things, I can tell you about some of the strategic um, directions of the college. Um, shorter term, I think, and by shorter term, I mean right now, I think a, a challenge is to restore community within the college. And that has been significantly degraded uh, because of COVID. You know, uh, Zoom is functional for certain things, but it really doesn't replace the I'm going to call them casual conversations on, uh, you know, at, at lunch and uh, just, you know, in the common room and, and where have you. And without going into a lot of detail, it actually has, I think, contributed to a sense of disconnect um, between the college council and the rest of the fellowship. And I think that's something over the next, you know, six months to a year that um, I think I can play a role. I hope I can play a role in trying to uh, restore. And part of it's simply, uh, you know, not me, but as, as a college, restoring um, normal practices of, of eating together and, and, and being present. Um, but there are ways, uh, more specifically, of getting groups of fellows together and, and starting to to sort of rebuild some of that, um, some of those more informal um, interactions. So I, I suppose that's, that's uh, you know, if you put it on me, what, you know, what, what do you think um, you will do as vice master? I think that's where I would focus. I think, I'm mean, coming back to climate change, I suppose one of the uh, strategic directions for the college is um, in the next decade is really to focus on um, uh, climate change mitigation, degasifying the college. Um, so one of the very many committees I chair is the Buildings Committee, uh, and the Buildings Committee has, uh, you know, has recent focus on precisely that point. How do we uh, take gas out of the college? Um, so two projects that will happen 
quite quickly um, is, uh, I think within the next year or so, we'll see ground source heat pumps feeding New Court, uh, which you may recall had significant renovations uh, just quite recently, Hugh. I said I didn't want to go into the climate. Yeah, change, sure. But just before coming on to <laughs> this call, I had my local uh, engineer here because I need a new heating system. Yeah, so do my we. My house was built in 1546, mm -hmm. and it's <clears throat> very complicated and very difficult. And the, uh, the possibility of doing it in heat pumps with heat pumps doesn't exist. I already have experience of a new heat pump in my swimming pool, which mm -hmm. is ineffective and very expensive. Yeah. And I would have thought that the buildings of Trinity College Cambridge are also completely unsuitable and cannot effectively be um, properly heated with heat pumps. But, I, I would very much appreciate um, a, a session committed to this whole subject at some point, um, uh, which just, I spend, in say... my political life spend a lot of time on, but it, it, it is a very long subject, but I am extremely skeptical about the effectiveness of uh, heat pumps. Well, let me say something just very quickly in regards to Trinity. As I say, the first, pro first major project, I think, will be New Court. And that was anticipated to some extent when the court was renovated, uh, because all the heating there is underfloor. And in order to make heat, heat pumps are most efficient if you can run them at low temperature. So your typical radiators in your house probably operate uh, between 60 and 80 degrees. Um, you know, they're quite hot to touch. Um, and uh, heat pumps are not efficient in producing uh, water at that temperature. Uh, but they can be very efficient at producing uh, water, hot water, up to about 40 degrees. Now, 40 degrees, of course, is plenty warm enough. You only want your house at around 20 degrees but it does mean that you need much bigger emitters. So 40 degree water through your conventional radiators is not gonna keep you warm, but if you can put your, your heat emitters throughout your whole floor, as has happened in Newcourt, um, then you can run uh, sort of warm water rather than hot water through those, and, uh, and that becomes efficient. So, that, you know, th that is a project we will do soon. Um, we are in discussion at the moment because we've got a major renovation of the northwest corner of Great Court going on. Is just, and it comes back to the historic question, you know, what can you do in a grade one listed building? Um, and you're absolutely right. It's much more challenging uh, there than in a new build. Uh, but the question is all about um, emitters. You know, what are the appropriate emitters? Uh, can you get all the way with heat pumps? Probably not. So, you know, a favoured solution probably is to use heat pumps to get the water up to about 40 degrees and then use, um, well, ultimately, probably electric uh, heaters of some sort to get you the rest of the way to the 60 or 80 degrees that you'd like to pump through your conventional radiators. But you're right, it's a big topic. We could spend a long time, um, which is not to cut, cut it short, but um, uh, Chicago. Yeah, um, could I ask a question about the heat pump in England? Um, I personally suffer from the low frequencies produced by the heat pump, and it is ah. uh, now getting a kind of issues in Austria, for example. Um, I haven't heard about it in Japan, but I, I wonder whether there is some solution for it. I, I'm afraid they may be, but I don't know it. Um, so actually, I hadn't heard of that before. Mm. Um, it's not much, how do you say, discussed openly, but no. there are quite a, a, a few people suffering from it. And I mean, I've heard of it in the context of wind farms. I hadn't heard it in the context of heat pumps. Um, heat pump produces a lot. 
And uh, yes, unfortunately. And so uh, I, my husband and I also wonder what to use for uh, the heating in our home uh, in mm -hmm. Vienna. Um, but then since I, I'm not a big fan of heat pump, and mm. so perhaps we, 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 at the moment, we decided for pellet oven. Yeah, I don't know, because of course there are different sorts of heat pump. We, Trinity does have its first heat pump, actually, but not in the main part of college. Uh, we've recently put one in uh, servicing one of the houses on Newton Road, if you know where that is. Um, mm, yes. Just, just south of the mm. Botanic Gardens. Where, where um, do you install? Where did you install the heat so that's pump? That's an in well, that's an air source heat pump, and you know it's a it's a unit about so big um, that sits, you know, just outside uh, next to the building. And you haven't got the complaints yet. Not yet. Um, so, but I'll, I'll keep my ears open. For the... <laughs> keep fingers crossed. But hopefully not too. Well. Um, so that that, that is a. It's a question it has arisen is just how noisy are they mm. but um and i don't have direct experience of that i, I need to go along and, and listen to one of them i'm told the harm is similar to a, a sort of domestic um freezer which of course is a heat pump i mean the, the fridges and freezers in our houses are, are heat pumps mm. it's the same fundamental science Well, maybe a, there's a historical solution in the painting above the high table at Trinity College. Henry VIII wearing all his gear, you know, we tend oh, not we to press. wear that amount of clothing, but, you know, Chinese quilted clothing is actually designed so that you can live in essentially uh, uninsulated uh, houses, which are, you know, you're just shutting uh, doors in winter um, and you can do it reasonably comfortably if the body itself is directly insulated by clothing maybe we have to think like that again His historically maybe we people do maybe did. we I mean, need to you know, open dress. fires are fine if you're facing them but if you're any distance from them they're much less effective so and um, people live like that so maybe we have to look again at how we live and the past, which is sort of one of my areas, has hints which we tend not even to consider. Mm. I mean, one of the things that you were mentioning was sailing boats and the comparison with uh, aircraft. And it all seems to me, you know, I, the, I mean, I don't suppose that actually world shipping contributes all that much, but at the point at which ships began to have engines, they basically mulched a tradition of moving stuff just using wind power. And it had actually developed by about 1900 to a pretty high level and it was destroyed, but it does demonstrate that it's perfectly possible to move huge amounts of freight, though probably on individually smaller vessels, just mm. using the wind if we were serious about it. Mm. No, I'm sure there are other, and, and the past will have lessons. No, we can all dress more warmly, that would turn. Um, <laughs> well, it's one I, I was always struck, it's always easy to point fingers in other places, but, uh, you know, I spent various periods in the States, and Chicago in particular, where it's very cold in the winter, but, you know, the, the, the norm was to put on your down parka when you're outside, uh, but to wear a t-shirt when you're inside, because the, the buildings are really heated to to extremes you know so could wear some more woolly jumpers and then we could... so are you coming to japan sometimes gray when it's possible again yeah i've i've actually i've never been to japan and really? it would be lovely to do that one day and, um... it would be fantastic normally we have dinners you know but with the virus now we have these discussions by zoom and that's right when the virus is subdued uh, maybe you can come to Japan and we'll make an event with you. <laughs> yeah, I would enjoy that. Thank you so much for your fantastic uh, discussion. And now we know how 
to fly <laughs> once it's possible again. <laughs> Good. Well, I hope it made some sense. And uh, yeah, it's, Thank it's, you, it's so very question. nice to meet you all. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I ask one, one, one quick question? Oh, yeah, John. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, sorry, it's a little bit off subject, but it was, it's more about Trinity and mm. sort of efforts to um, towards mitigating climate change. And I was wondering, was something that I got interested in recently was the whole um, rewilding uh, mm. lawns. And I wondered if if there's any kind of rewilding stuff going on with all the grass and the lawns in, in yeah. Trinity, because that's a huge... Uh, Sure. In a very obvious way in which the environment can be. I mean, I've been reading this uh, scientist um, Golson who talks a lot about saving insects by rewilding yeah. lawns in the United Kingdom. And well, well, New Newcourt has been wilded, um, right. but uh, I think not for that purpose. I think it was just um, the gardener thought it would be att attractive to do that and. Uh. Um, Things I I think it'll be many years before Great Court is wilded, but, <laughs> uh, but maybe there are other areas that it could be thought about. Just out of curiosity, thank you very much. It was very fascinating. Was a, Not at all. I'm a, I'm a very nervous flyer, so I don't I don't know. Oh, I, sorry. I, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> sort of, it's a little bit worrying to think it's only a millimeter of viscosity. No, no but it works. It yeah, works. but it works, no, no. of course. Works. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Gray. Thank you so very, very much. And thank you, everybody. Thank uh, you, Gerhard, yes. for organizing it. Oh, well, no worries. We'll have actually, we have a, many very, very interesting talks coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gray, also, you're very welcome at all our events, of course. And thank you so much. Good. All the best. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you very much. Very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.